It's a very hot day, and the soldier gets off the horse, and he goes over to a water hole, and he takes a drink. Does this sound familiar? Have you ever heard this, Medrash? The soldier is drinking by the water hole, and as he's bent over drinking, he's got a pouch stuffed with gold coins, and the pouch falls out of his pocket, and he doesn't notice that it fell out. He finishes drinking, he gets on his horse, and he rides away. A short time later, a 12-year-old boy comes by, goes over to the water hole, bends down, takes a drink, and he notices a pouch, opens it up, stuffed with gold coins. He goes home running happily. Him and his mother, they'll be able to live now with this gold, with this poor orphan boy, they'll be able to live off the money. A short time later, a little old man comes by, goes over to the water, takes a drink, lies down to go to sleep. In the meantime, the soldier's on the horse, touches his pocket, and he sees he's missing his pouch. So he turns around, he figures the only place he could have lost the money. It's got to be at the water hole. So he goes back to the water hole. And sure enough, who's there? There's a little old man is lying there. So he gives the old man a hard kick. He wakes him up. He says, give me my money. The old man, he looks at him and says, I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. So the soldier says, look, I, you know, I'm, I'm not patient. I, I, I'm in a hurry. Give me the money or I'm going to kill you. The old man says, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. The soldier takes out a sword. He kills the old man, searches his pocket, and doesn't find the money. He gets on the horse and he rides away. With that, the vision fades, and God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, you see there's perfect justice in the world. <laughs> Moshe Rabbeinu says, I don't, I don't uh, see any perfect justice in the world at this at all. As a matter of fact, I see distortion all the way through. So God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, okay, I'm going to show you another vision. Watch this vision, and then maybe you'll understand how my justice works in the world. So God, but God shows Moshe Rabbeinu a vision of a very thick forest with a clearing right in the middle of the forest. And Moshe Rabbeinu sees there's a soldier sitting on a horse, and he's back in the thickness of the forest, and he's just sitting on his horse. He's got a very clear view of the clearing. And all of a sudden, a father and his two-year-old toddler son come walking through the clearing in the forest. They're taking a nice stroll on a sunny day. And they're walking through this clearing, and all of a sudden, from the other side of the clearing, a bandit jumps out, and he starts wrestling with the father. And he eventually overpowers the father. He pulls out a dagger, and he kills the father. He reaches into the, searches the pockets, and in the pockets he finds a pouch stuffed with gold coins. He grabs the money, and he starts running away. He's in such a hurry to get away, he carelessly drops the pouch. The soldier, back in the thickness of the forest, who's been watching the entire scene unfold, sees the pouch fall. Comes riding in, picks up the pouch, and he rides off. And again, the vision fades. And God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, now do you understand my justice? And Moshe Rabbeinu says, now I'm doubly clueless. So HaKadosh Baruch says to Moshe Rabbeinu, okay, now I'm going to explain it to you. And I want you to know that after I explain it to you, even though you'll understand, that's still only the tip of the iceberg in understanding my entire running of the world and how justice works in the world. He says to Moshe Rabbeinu, the vision that I showed you by the water hole, the first vision I show you actually took place 10 years after the vision in the forest. So the soldier who lost the money at the water hole in the first vision was the same soldier who 10 years earlier had found the money in the forest. The 12-year-old boy who found the money at the water hole 10 years earlier was a 2-year-old whose father was brutally murdered. He should have inherited the money then. It took 10 years, and eventually he got the money that was rightfully his. He found it at the water hole. And the little old man who was so brutally killed, murdered at the water hole, ten, young, 10 years earlier was an energetic bandit. He murdered the father, and therefore he was murdered. And not only that, the same soldier who should have intervened in the forest to break it up and killed the bandit to protect the father, it took 10 years, but he caught him at the water hole and eventually killed him at the water hole. God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, you know, sometimes life's events are a whole blur None of it makes any sense at all until you see how the scenes unfold. That's what the Torah means. Afterward, you'll see my back. You can't see the front. When you get the explanation, whether in this world or the world to come, then obviously everything works out the way it's meant to work out. That's the, that's the first, uh, first medrash. There's another medrash I want to tell you. There is one of the sages is called Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi once met the prophet Elio. You know, the Gemara says Elio Anavi comes back to this world in different forms. Uh, uh, he comes back, he's a Kohen, so it could be me. Uh, Elio Anavi comes back in different forms, and he helps people out various times. We have all sorts of stories about Elio Anavi in the, in the Gemara and in the Midrashim. So the Gemara says that Elio Anavi once met up with Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. 
And Rabbi Shodu Levi said to Eli I'd like to spend the day with you th seeing the things that you do as you travel out throughout the world. And Eli Onev says, look, I'll make you a deal. You're not going to like what you see. And therefore, I'll make you a deal. You can come with me as long as you don't ask any questions. Well, if you ask any questions, then I have to leave and no more. You can't see any more. So Rabbi Shodu Levi says, okay. And they start traveling. And they get to a town. And they knock on the door of a very wealthy man. Very, very wealthy man, a giant mansion. And uh, they ask if they could be put up for the night. And the man says, no, I'm not putting you up for the night. You go, go sleep in the barn if you want. I'm not giving you anything to eat. You could eat some, uh, gives them some dry bread crust. Says, sleep in the barn. That's where you're staying. He slams the door in their face. Okay, they go into the barn. And at midnight, Elion gets up and he does something, uh, whatever it is, whatever powers he has. And he builds this huge, beautiful edifice in the background, marble, inlaid with <laughs> gold and everything. Just a gorgeous building that he builds for this old for this man in the backyard. And Rabbi Shobat Levi is like, why does he deserve that? You know? And he's about to ask, and he remembers he's not allowed to say anything. Okay, they go traveling, and they come to another town, and they knock on the door a little hovel, a very poor man. And they knock on the door, they ask, can we come in? Do you have room? Could you put us up? The poor man says, please come in. You're my guest. I, I feel bad. I wish I could give you something more comfortable. This is all I've got, but you're welcome to the best. And here's, he gives them a meager meal. He says, if I had more, I'd give you more, everything else. And they put some, they get to go to sleep. Okay, gives them some straw to make their beds a little more comfortable. And in the middle of the night, Elianovi gets up and he goes out to the barn. And there's a cow, which is how the poor man made his livelihood, a milk cow. And Leona, he says something, and the cow dies. And you shouldn't believe he's got, he's got smoke coming out of his ears by this point. He says, what? The guy, what? Why? Are you? Okay. Nope, can't say anything. They go traveling. They get to a certain town, and they start knocking on doors. Nobody is willing to host them at all. So they leave the town, and Elio, and now he turns to the entire town, and he says, may you all rise to prominence. And he goes to another town, and everybody's fighting over them to have them as the ho to host them. Everybody wants the guests. They want to open up their homes in hospitality. They stays in somebody's house. And as he leaves the town, he turns to the town and he says, may only one of you rise to prominence. And at this point, Rabbi Shubhalev says, I can't take it anymore. I cannot take it anymore. You know, I don't care. You can leave, leave, stay, stay. Why are you doing these things? So he always says to them, okay, I'll have to explain, but I'm going to leave. You see, the town, the structure, that, that nasty rich man that we stayed at his house, the first guy we knocked on his door, and I built that structure in his backyard, that structure is going to collapse in a matter of days. It's going to be a huge pile of rubble. And underneath, there's a buried treasure, which now he's never going to find. He goes, uh-huh. And what about, what about the cow? You know, that poor man who was so gracious, and then he took away his parnasi, he killed his guy. Leonard says, you know, I knew that in heaven there was a decree that at midnight his wife was supposed to die. And I was able, because of his hospitality, to exchange the cow for his wife, to redeem his wife on the cow. So he'll struggle with parnasi, but at least he won't have lost his wife. Uh huh, uh huh. And why is it that? And why is it that that city where they're also nasty? You bless them; they should all rise to prominence. And over there, only one of them. He says, "Listen, in a town where everybody rises to prominence, there's going to be fighting and arguing, and who's going to be the leader, and who's going to be in a town where there's one leader, where there's only one person rises to prominence. They've got one rabbi in the city. The community lives in peace and harmony because they got one person leading them." And he says, uh-huh, and that's it, Elionavi takes leave. That's what the Medrash says. So all of this is an idea that from a human perspective, and you see with life in general, you know, there's so many things we wonder about and why, why this and why that and why the other. Then you've got to wait, and often it's only as years pass that you see certain things in your life that, you know, boy, that's the best thing that ever happened to me, or that was a very good thing, or that wasn't a, you know, you know whatever it is, however it unfolds. Sometimes it's in this life, and sometimes it's in the world to come. Okay, that's idea number one. Idea number two, now this is a very, very deep idea. And again, this is like a, it, it's, it's like painting. Anna, do any of you understand painting? Any of you understand painting? Okay, so I have the clue, I have the clue, the first clue about painting. And there's nothing anybody, very little you'd be able to explain to me about painting, and certainly music. Certainly music, I could hear a symphony, you know, and it would take, you know, you know I could, could imagine and trying to explain what it is I'm supposed to be appreciating to somebody who has zero, it could be you could educate me a little bit, but it would take a long time, take a long time. And some people just listen, I have one of my son, my wife, neither my wife nor I have any musical talent uh, 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 at all, at all, uh, not, not at all, neither of us. I think I took clarinet for two weeks when I was a kid. I kept biting through the reed though, so, you know, so I had to give it up. My wife never played a musical instrument. Neither of us, all, all we do is we like Elton John. You know, that's about it. You know, that, that's as far as our musical appreciation goes. 
So one of my sons, you know, my kids used to play in a room. We, they, they played with the neighbor's kids. And somebody had, had like this, uh, this electric organ and uh, what's it called, a keyboard. And the kids would go in the back room and they'd bang around on the keyboard. And I'd, once in a while I'd hear a tune coming from the keyboard. And I thought to myself, well, I guess it's one of these pre-programmed keyboards. And they probably push the button, you know, plays and plays a tune. And the tunes were getting better a little more. And I came in there, who the heck is making? My son is 10 years old, he's playing tunes. He said, where did you learn that? He goes, I don't know. And he's going to play tunes. You know, he said, I play tunes, play tunes. And he's getting better than any tune I would give him. He could just play it right on the keyboard. Now, you're talking about somebody who is zero, zero, not me, not my wife, nobody, not in their family, you know, I, 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 nothing. And the kid picked up the keyboards. He now knows how to play guitar. All self-taught. He can't read a musical key. Paul McCartney can't read music. You know that? Paul McCartney cannot read music. Right? So how did he do it? I, I don't know if he could read, but he can't read music, that's for sure. I, you know, how did you, what do you call it? You know, how? The answer, I don't know. And he can't even explain to you how he knows. So, how get, so sometimes a medrash is also something, oh, by the way, you know, we sing on Shabbos, Zemiros. Uh, one of the Zemiros that I sing is Menucha V'Simcha. I sing it to this, uh, did you ever hear this tune? Menucha V'Simcha Or La Yudim Yaim Shabbat Sain Yaim Achmadim does anybody sound familiar? Scarborough Fair from Simon and Garfunkel. Right. Did any of you have heard of Simon and Garfunkel? Okay, you've heard of Scarborough Fair? Okay, did you hear me singing it? Or, or did I not? Did I, is I, uh, go ahead, I could, give me your best shot. You know, I can take it. <laughs> so, so what happened was I once heard that Simon and Garfunkel, I, somebody said, somebody mentioned Simon and Garfunkel put their, got their, their, their tunes from their grandfather's Shabbos Zemiros which is a nice heartwarming legend, right? So I decided to try it. Let's see if any of the tunes work on Shabbos Mirror. So the first thing I tried was Menucha V'Simcha with Scarborough Fair. Fit like a glove. Mommy's fit like a glove. Little did I know, uh, then no, nothing else has ever fit since then, and I've tried. You know, nothing else has fit any of the Zemiros. So the story is probably an urban legend. It has no truth to it at all. Then I spoke to Rabbi Salinger, and he told me Scarborough Fair is an old Irish ballad. It has nothing to do with Shabbos Zemiros from anybody in Europe. It's an old Irish ballad, Rabbi Salinger knows. And, and uh, what do you call it? And, 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 uh, and then I also saw that Scarborough, that Scarborough Fair fits about just about any. The, 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 the rhythm of Scarborough Fair fits about if it's other. There are people sing Drury, Krauts of Scarborough Fair, Drury. So I think I guess everything fits it. So then I bought my kid as he was getting better. I bought him an electric. Uh, what do you call it? I bought him a keyboard, and this was one of those pre-programmed keyboards. He's about thirteen, so he pushes the keyboard, and uh, you know he's listening to some of these pre, you know, these lead-ins from somebody. And all of a sudden he hears da 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 da. He comes running. He's like, Daddy, they even have Shabbos and Miros on here. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you raise when you raise a Haredi ghetto child, <laughs> you know. So, so they have since they have since advanced to, to, to bigger and better things. So, so I'm going to tell you a medrash. I'm going to tell you a medrash, and uh, and we'll see if you pick it up. The the Torah says like this. If you take a look at page five fourteen, um, and uh, pasuk twenty nine, and here we have Michelangelo's contribution to Judaism. <laughs> Uh, uh, it says uh, in, in verse 29, Vayihi <coughs> beredes, it's five lines from the top, Vayihi beredes Moshe behar Sinai, when Moshe came down from the mountain, Ushne luchos ha'edus biyad Moshe, there were two tablets in his hand, berida to min ha'har, Moshe lo yodaki koran or parav, Moshe did not know that his face was glowing, bedabro ito. Moshe did not know that his face was glowing uh, uh, when, 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 when God spoke with him. Now, uh, 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 you know, the word Koran and the word Karen, Karen is a horn. So Rashi over here says, it's in the right column. Yeah, for three lines from the bottom. Ki Koran, Ki Koran. Says the Rashi, Lashon Karnaim. It's a, an expression that is a play on the word horns. Sheha or Maviku Bolek Kimin Karen. The light protrudes like a horn. Let's say he had horns of light. The light protrudes like a horn. So uh, uh, um, what, what do you call it? Uh, 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 Michelangelo made this famous words in the sister, what's it called? The Sistine, I was going to say the pristine. I didn't know. I know it's it something with the in. You know, in the Sistine Chapel, he's got with most of it with the horns, which is where the rumor started that Jews have horns. And there have been plenty of Jews who have been confronted by 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 uneducated 
Southerners who have wondered, you know, where where are thank you for thank you, Mr. Fogel, who have wondered, you know, where they, they even think that we have the yarmulke covers the horns, right? And guys have said to me, you know, people have said, you know, they, they said to you, where, where are your horns? They thought Jews have horns. So that's where it comes from. Here, what the Torah really tells you is Kikoran or of the Moshe Rabbeinu's face was glowing. Moshe Rabbeinu's face was glowing. I was once asked by a Quaker when I was in college as a young lady who was a Quaker. She was actually fairly, it, was, it wasn't a very uh, high-level college. She was, she was fairly intelligent, and uh, she wanted me to explain what tzitzis are about. She wanted to understand tzitzis. You know, I myself uh, don't understand tzitzis, but I was going to explain it to a Quaker. And the other thing that people are enchanted by is how we manage to keep our yarmulkes on. You know, they, and then one, you know, they, especially when I used to play ball, the black guys called me Beanie. They, Yo, Beanie, take your shot. You know, you know, they called me Beanie. So one guy I know that went to school, and a black guy said to him, how you balance that thing? <laughs> you know, because he has a yarmulke on his head, little, little knitted yarmulke. So I had one person ask me, I think it was also a girl in college, she asked me if the different colored yarmulkes, you know, the knitted yarmulkes, she said, does that mean signify from a certain tribe? <laughs> Which I was very, very, I thought that it was a very creative question. A very creative question, you know, well, you know, well, you got a different color one, maybe, that's, maybe that means something. So Moshe Rabbeinu comes out and in, 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 in the, the, light, the light is glowing. The light is glowing. So um, um, remarkably, by the way, remarkably, I never encountered any anti-Semitism in college for, for my yarmulke. Sometimes on the streets of Chicago, once in a while, a car would drive by and somebody would yell something. More than anything, there's respect. When a person respects himself and his religion, uh, people respect him. People respect when you're making a stand. One time, I'm, some guy made a comment. Uh, he was a jerk anyway, even though even his friends didn't like him. He was, he was, and we were playing intramural basketball, and I stole, I stole the ball from him, and then I heard behind me something about my, my Jewish ancestors. But I, he doesn't even know my family, so I don't know where he got it from. But, uh, you know, that was, that was the only time in college that I ran into any sort of, any sort of anti -Zion. People stare all the time. But, you know, oh, what the heck. <laughs> but but the, uh, the, 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 I didn't run into any anti-Semitism. So there's a remarkable statement. Now, now, the statement says like this. Where did Moshe Rabbeinu get the rays of, ink, rays of light from? Okay, now pay attention, care. If you hear it, you hear it. So Medrash says, the ink that was left in the quill, God wiped on Moshe Rabbeinu's forehead. And from that ink came the rays of light. Okay. Scott, what's your reaction to that medrash? Um, First thing that comes to mind. That the ink or whatever is for like for wisdom or whatever, like wisdom for interpreting laws. And okay, okay, that's certainly certainly contained in there. The ink left in the quill. If the quill wrote the Torah, and you write that ink on Moshe Rabbeinu, so somehow that's the wisdom and the glow of spirituality of Torah. Okay. So I'll tell you a question that the commentary is asking. This different commentary is asking. It's not the question I would have asked, but the commentary is asking like this. Listen, if God wrote the Torah with a quill, whatever that means, God's precise enough not to have any ink left in it at all. So why should there be any ink left in the quill? That's what they're bothered by. In other words, if there's already a statement like that, let's take it to the limit. If, 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 if the statement says, if, if, if the statement, if God wrote with a quill, God doesn't need a quill, God doesn't need ink. If you're already talking about God and a quill and ink, so the same God who writes with a quill should know how much ink you need in the quill and not have to have any ink. That's the question. The two commentaries ask that question. So I want to give you two answers. What does it mean there was ink left in the quill? Why should there be any ink left in the quill? What does it mean it was wiped off on Moshe Rabbeinu? So we find twice in the Torah. Take a look at the first Pasuk in the book of Vayikra, on page 544. See the word Vayikra el Moshe. The book of Vayikra starts with God called to Moshe. Vayikra el Moshe. It's a small aleph. Why is there a small aleph there? And Moshe Rabbeinu was embarrassed that he should have written that God called to Moshe. Vayikra el Moshe. Everybody's there. Moshe Rabbeinu, in his humility, was embarrassed that God should make a public display of God called to Moshe. So we don't find the word Vayikra before. We find Vayomer, Vayidaber, Vayikra, specific calling to Moshe Rabbeinu, even, even a greater degree of intimacy between God and Moshe. Moshe Rabbeinu was embarrassed. He said, please, God, don't write that about me. So God said, all right, I'll write with a small aleph. Well, if you write with a small aleph, if there was enough ink for a big aleph, so then there's some ink is left, and that gets wiped off on Moshe Rabbeinu. What does that tell you? What, is, what, what does that ink really signify? Humility. Humility. The glow from Moshe Rabbeinu is the humility of Moshe Rabbeinu. The Moshe Rabbeinu, 
the humility for a smaller Aleph, that's what's glowing from his forehead. You understand, you understand the metaphorical use of the word in, in, in the Medrash. Not only that, remember in Parshas Tetzave, what's missing, what word is missing? In the entire book Parsha of Tetzave, what word does not appear? Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu's name. Remember Moshe Rabbeinu said to God, if you don't forgive the Jewish people, erase me from your book. So God says, okay, one Parsha won't have your name. One Parsha won't have your name. Isn't that remarkable? So if there's ink left in the quill because Moshe's name wasn't written, so what does that really mean? It means that Moshe Rabbeinu was selfless on behalf of the Jewish people. That's why there's ink left in the quill. So that quill that's wiped off on Moshe Rabbeinu is a combination of two traits. Selflessness for the Jewish people and humility. That's why his face is glowing. That's what the Medrash is trying to tell you. Isn't that beautiful, Medrash? That's the ink left in the quill. That Moshe Rabbeinu merits it, that means that it's really the Medrash that's communicating the idea of both humility and selflessness for the Jewish people. And by the way, aren't you bothered by anything? It says Moshe Rabbeinu comes down and his face is glowing. You should have a, a logical question here. Nothing about the wording. Moshe Rabbeinu goes up to get the second luchos. Remember, this is the second time he goes up. He comes down and his face is glowing. You should be bothered by a very logical question. Why wasn't it glowing for the first Yes. I mean, if it's going to glow, and the first luchos were even on a higher level. First luchos were on a higher level. God wrote those ones. God made those ones. Moshe Rabbeinu brought up the second stones. What's the answer? Because he wouldn't need to wipe the small off. You're close. You're in the right direction. In, in other words? Close, close. What happened between the first and second luchos, Isaac? Well, the, um, they were... Right, the golden calf, which is what caused Moshe Rabbeinu to go to bat for the Jewish people. That means when Moshe Rabbeinu went up the first time, yeah, you were on, you were on a very high level. The second time you went up, you would go on to bat for the Jewish people because of the eagle had taken place. Oh, you're on a higher level. Now your face close. And from that, there's a lesson for us on a Musser level. That when a person is selfless, and you go to bat for other people, your entire level goes up. The entire level of the people goes up when you go to bat for other people. That's the idea, that's the idea of Moshe Rabbeinu being put on a, on a pedestal now as opposed to previous, because Moshe Rabbeinu was Moser Nefesh for the Jewish people. Okay. Um, one last thought. The Novominsker Rebbe is one of the contemporary, one of the contemporary uh, 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 leaders of the Jewish people. And he once said, you know, this idea that Moshe's face was glowing, every Jew has a glow. Every Jew has a glow. You can't see it if you look in the mirror. Don't go running up to the mirror and say, you know, do I see him? Am I glowing today? <laughs> right? No, it just means you're hungover. You know, <laughs> you're not, you're not glowing. But, 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 every Jew has a glow. And you yourselves have seen people who you feel that they're in a high enough level. You know, that guy, he, that person, he seems to glow. Have you ever seen Rabbi Chaim Kenevsky? You go to Rabbi Chaim Kenevsky, and it just seems to be a glow. You know, everybody goes in like, whoa, you're just in awe without even knowing why you're, every Jew has that glow. I once had the best thing, you know, when you're a father and you have sons in your shiva, you're always nervous when you call the Rosh Shiva to find out how your son is doing. You know, you're always, as a parent, you know, you're always nervous about the report. So one of my sons got the issue, but he was my, he was my, uh, uh, what do you call it? He was, he was our, 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 the most challenging one. He was the loose cannon in the family. He was getting serious, but he was, still had a loose head. And then he went to yeshiva, and I wanted to find out how he's doing in the yeshiva. So I called, you know, I called, I spoke to Rosh Hashiva on a regular basis. He's doing well, he's doing well, he's doing well, better than we expect. And then one day I called Rosh Hashiva, how he's doing. He says, what should I tell you? He's got the face of a yeshiva bachar. It's the nicest thing that any... It's the nicest thing that I ever heard from a teacher. It's got the face of Yeshua Bachar. You take a look at Mir, you go into the Mir Yeshua, you don't have to be a genius. Take a look at, take a look at guys who are sitting and learning Torah. They have a certain purity, there's a certain, a certain purity. I don't want to use the word Kedusha, it sounds a little too, too, too intense. There's a certain purity, Kedusha, that people have, people who keep Torah in mitzvahs. There's a certain effect. Every single Jew has it. Every single Jew has a Kirin Orp on it. Not necessarily like Moshe Rabbeinu, and we don't necessarily have to put a mask on our face. Moshe Rabbeinu puts a mask on his face to, to, to stop the glow. People are intimidated by seeing the glow of Moshe Rabbeinu. Does he always wear the mask? He wears the mask at very some. When he's speaking to God and speaking to the people, he takes it off, then he puts it on. It's a little unclear from Rashi exactly when it went on, when it went off, but most of the time, it, 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 when he was not in direct contact with God, he was wearing the mask. 
So uh, 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 one of the commentaries points out, you know what that mask symbolizes? The mask, at a literal level, the Moshe had a cloth mask that he put on his face. He had like almost what a, uh, a ski. The mask is the mask of authority. In other words, a person, Moshe Rabbeinu, this is the, one of the challenges that we always find, he has to go against his entire essence of his character to become the leader of the people. He's the most humble man in history. He has to be the leader of the Jewish people. A leader has to put on a mask of authority. The way they put it in the rabbinic world is, don't take yourself too seriously, but take your job seriously. Every rabbi of a community has always been told that. Don't take, take your job seriously. Don't take yourself too seriously. Because your job, you, you, you represent the position. You represent a king in Torah law. A father could forego his honor. Son walks into the room. Father could tell son, don't stand up for me. A Kohen Godel, a Kohen or a Kohen Godel could forego his honor. I forego my honor. A king is not allowed to forego his honor. The king of the Jewish people is not allowed to forego his honor. Even if he says, don't stand up for me or don't honor me, you have to honor the king. Because his honor is on his own. The honor is the, is the, is the position that he represents, that he, he has been given the position, and he has to uphold the position even if he's humble. Shaul HaMelech, the first king, was the most humble of men. David HaMelech was a shepherd. These are all humble people. But once you become the king, it's not you. It's not about you. Now you have to take responsibility for the, for the position that you, that you represent. Yeah, yeah Benyamin, go ahead. Would that just go for the king of the Jewish people or for all kings? I don't know about non-Jewish kings. I know that non-Jewish kings, uh, non-Jewish kings would be wise to uphold the position. Uh, I remember I mentioned to you Jimmy Carter when Jimmy Carter got elected. So Jimmy Carter decided he was going to show everybody he's one of the boys. So he was walking around in golf shirts, and he made sure to be photographed carrying his own bags onto onto uh, the, the presidential presidential uh, plane. You know, and shows that when he got, and his ratings started plummeting. I don't want a president who's carrying his bags. I want a king. The yeah. President of the United States would be wise to put on a, a crown. His ratings would go skyrocketing. He'd be, he'd be wise to put on a crown. The worst thing, Bill Clinton, I remember seeing Bill Clinton, they had a, he was allowed himself to be photographed in his jogging suit. I don't want a president who's in a jogging suit. I want a president that looks like a president. I don't want a guy in a jogging suit. I wear jogging suits too. I want a guy who's sitting there. I want authority. That's the people, in and you should know, I'll give you a priceless piece of advice. When you're married, try to always look presentable, even in the house. Don't walk around in a T-shirt with meatball stains on it. Walk around, walk around with if you wear if you wear a suit and tie, if you wear a tie, and if you wear a crown, that would be even better, right? Because your wife wants to look up to her husband. She's like a guy who looks like you know he looks like he just came out of a tavern, smells like a beer. She wants a guy. She wants a guy she could look up to. She put her life in your hands. And she, put, she put her life in your hands. She, well, oh, this is the guy I put my I put my life in his hands. The guy looks like he the guy looks like he fell out of the back of a truck. You know, you know, <laughs> I, you know. I, this is this is the guy. What do you call it? That's that, that, that's the idea. That's the mask of authority. Okay, we'll continue. <laughs>